All right, shout out one, shout out one, one moment. Let me just check, see if I'm on. Okay, cool, cool. Looks like on live. All right, so long. All right, Shalom, Shalom. I want to give all praise, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai, Bahashem, Rechakodash, Babylonish, to our apostles and elders, the great millstone. Peace and blessing and many salutations to you, elect Akim, across the four winds of this earth, pushing this word in sincerity and in truth. Okay, and as you see the title, as you see the title of this lesson, it says, A Holy Priesthood, a gift from Yahweh. Okay, and within this lesson, I'm going to touch up on the priesthood and how the priesthood acted as a gift, all right, unto the nation of Israel, okay? And I'm going to go into the ancient priesthood, and I'm going to go into how the ancient priesthood was a gift that was given unto the children of Israel, and how that priesthood was transferred, okay? It was made um, before as the priesthood or the, uh, under the order of Aaron, all right? And now we are priests under the order of Melchizedek. Okay, and that was a transferring that had to take place. It had to transfer from the sons of Aaron, all right, and be transferred unto David and Judah, okay, because Yahweh Shai again sprung out of Judah, and he is our eternal priest, okay. Yahweh Shai is all of our high priests, okay. And the men of the Lord pushing his word, prophesying, operate as priests as well because we offer up ourselves as a living sacrifice, being those mediators, okay, to the elect. To Yahweh Shai, okay, as Yahweh Shai is our mediator, okay, to Yahweh, okay. So the first scripture that I'm going to start off on is going to be in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. And Lord's will, this lesson is edifying. This will be my third attempt to trying to get this lesson done, you know, but hey, it'd be like that sometimes. But I'm going to start on 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, and I'm going to read it. It says, Yea, also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to the Most High by Yahweh Shai Mashiach. Okay, so it had reference here, the Apostle Peter had made reference right here going into the spiritual sacrifices that this holy priesthood is going to be offering up here. All right, and that spiritual sacrifices started with Yahweh Shai putting himself or being put on the cross. To bear the burden for the whole nation of Israel, but it also goes to us offering up ourselves a sacrifice. That's the spiritual sacrifice because the carnal sacrifice was us getting that lamb, that goat, that bullock, that turtle dove, whatever sacrificial animal that you had, and you would um, give it unto the priests and they would sacrifice it on the altar. And that blood would be an atonement for our iniquities that we had done. Okay? Now we understand the law of sacrifice was changed. Okay, we don't have to get no turtle dove or no lamb or no goat and offer it up because our spiritual sacrifice was Yahweh Shai. Okay, and as Yahweh Shai is that mediator and that sacrifice that was offered up, okay, we also make ourselves that living sacrifice as the Apostle Paul had made the statement going into. Okay, and I'm going to pull that precept real quick in Romans the 13th chapter. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 12. And this is Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of the Most High, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto the Most High, which is your reasonable service. Okay, so how we make ourselves that living sacrifice, all right, is whether we're on the highways and the hedges, okay? Well, namely, that's the main form of sacrifice that we offer up, all right, because as we go on the highways, that, uh, that corner is represented as the altar, and we're represented as the sacrifice that's on the altar. And we're being seen by many. Okay? And we do these things for the nation of Israel. We make ourselves a sacrifice for the elect of Israel, I should say. Just as that priest was that mediator that offered a sacrifice unto the nation of Israel. Okay? Now, um, as you see within the title, and shout along to you all that are, that are getting on. Okay? But um, as you see in the title, it goes into the priesthood being a gift all right, of the Most High. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the history of that, that priesthood operated as that gift. Okay. And the first scripture that I'm going to start off on is going to be in the book of Numbers, the 18th chapter. It's going to touch upon a little bit of history of the priesthood going in the order of Aaron. All right. Because Aaron was the first high priest under that particular order. Okay. Now, granted, you did have a high priest before that, and that was uh, Melchizedek, which is Malak Tazadak, meaning king of righteousness. Okay. And that priesthood that followed afterwards, okay, under Aaron was more so a carnal representation of a spiritual priesthood that already existed. Okay. But the Heavenly Father had to have this play out for a bigger picture to get painted. Okay, this priesthood under the order of Aaron was a blueprint, all right, was a blueprint of a priesthood that existed before, and that priesthood that priesthood that existed before coming back into fruition under Yahweh Shai, okay? And I'm going to pull that, pres that precept up here shortly, but I'm going to start off in the book of Numbers, the 18th chapter, and I'm going to start at verse, let's see here. I'll just start from the top. Okay, that way we can get an understanding on the priesthood under Aaron. Okay, so this is in the book of Numbers, chapter 18, verse 1. It says, And the Lord said unto Aaron, Thou and thy sons and thy father's house with thee shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary, and thou and thy sons with thee shall bear the iniquity of the priesthood. Now, what does that mean when it says Aaron and his sons will, uh, will bear the iniquity of the sanctuary and the pre and, um, and the children of Israel and the priesthood. Well, when you go into that, all that's pretty much saying is Aaron and his sons, which acted as the priesthood, were the ones that had to make atonement for the iniquity of the children of Israel. Okay, and the way that they had to make atonement for that was to offer up sacrifice. Okay, let's lock it. It's a little crooked. There we go. All right. So when you continue to read in Numbers eighteen and two. It says, and thy brethren also of the tribe of Levi, the tribe of thy father, bring thee out with thee that they may be joint unto thee and minister unto thee that thou and thy sons with thee shall minister before the tabernacle of witness. Mm -hmm. Okay, because one thing to think about it, when you go into this, he's pretty much establishing the priesthood. He's explaining that Aaron, who was the high priest and Aaron's sons, were going to be the priesthood. But the Lord had also set up the children of Levi, or the sons of Levi, to help aid within the ministry as pertaining to doing duties in regards to the sanctuary, okay? So you had different tribes of Levi that had different operations when it came to ordaining and decking out the sanctuary. They all had different jobs, okay? But the key role within the Levites in the sanctuary was the priesthood, starting with Aaron and his sons, okay? So when you continue to read this, it says, and they shall keep thy charge in the charge of all the tabernacle. Only they shall not come nigh into the vessels of the sanctuary and the altar that neither they nor ye also die. And they shall be joined unto thee and keep the charge of the tabernacle of the congregation for all the service of the tabernacle and a stranger shall not come nigh unto you. All right, because they had to make themselves separate when they went into the temple to offer up sacrifice, okay? The only ones that were able to go into the sanctuary within those veils were the priesthood, okay? And the only one that was able to go into the chief veil, all right, which is the second veil, which is the holiest of holies, only the high priest was able to go in there, all right? And he was only able to go in there once a year. And that was when he was offering, the, um, you know, pretty much sat on the mercy seat, okay? That was around the time of the day of atonement. All right, and if any man broke that order, they would be put to death. That's what the scripture is saying right here. Okay, and it says in verse five, and ye shall keep the charge of the sanctuary and the charge of the altar, and there be no wrath anymore upon the children of Israel. Okay, because if these orders weren't kept, if those sacrifices weren't offered, or if the children of Israel were to offer up um, an abominable sacrifice, all right, if they were to uh, if they were to give only a piece of their tithe, okay, the Lord will bring forth wrath unto the nation of Israel. Because you remember, the children of Israel had to pay a tenth or a tithe, all right? That's what the word tithe means. It means tenth. They had to give that of their first fruit unto the priest, okay? It couldn't be nothing with blemish. It had to be something that was 
the best or the choice of their flock or the choice or the best of their fruit. All right. And the tenth of that had to be offered up unto the priesthood. OK. And if that order was not kept, the Lord would send forth wrath unto the nation of Israel. OK. Mm -hmm. Whether that wrath was the Lord sending a famine. OK. Whether him drying, drying everything up to the point where it didn't rain. All right. And that would cause devastation unto the harvest and devastation unto your flock. OK. So these were the key duties that had to be kept in order for us to have peace with the Most High, okay? And it started with giving what you had unto the priesthood, okay? So we continue to read this. It says in verse uh, 6, And I behold, I have taken your brethren, the Levites, this is the key point to this verse here, I have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the children of Israel. To you they are given as a gift for the Lord, to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. So back then in the ancient world, the Levites were set aside to be a gift, all right? The Levites were a gift unto the nation of Israel that was sent from the Most High. Because you remember, when you go into it, all right, as we had received our land, the land of Canaan, okay, later on being changed to the land of Israel, all the tribes of Israel were given a particular portion of their land. Judah had a particular portion of land. Benjamin had a particular portion of land. Issachar did. Ephraim, Manasseh, Asher, Zebulon. All those different tribes had different portions of the land that was given unto them. And that was given unto them for an inheritance. Now the children of Levi, they didn't have a portion of land that was given unto them. Their portion was to, was to be the priesthood. Their portion was to ordain the sanctuary. Okay, that was given unto the nation of Levi. OK, and that was them being a gift unto the nation of Israel because they had to offer up that sacrifice. OK, and just to prove what I just explained. OK, I'm going to pull up this precept here. I believe it's in Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter. Let me see here. This is Deuteronomy, chapter 10, verse eight. It says at that time. The Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister unto him, and to bless in his name unto this day. Wherefore, Levi hath no part nor inheritance with his brethren. The Lord is his inheritance, according to the Lord thy promise, I'm sorry, according to the Lord Yahweh thy God promised him. Okay, so just as I explained earlier, the tribe of Levi didn't actually have a physical inheritance that was given unto them. They didn't have a physical land that was given unto them like the rest of the tribes. But their inheritance was to, to ordain the sanctuary, all right? And the choice of the Levites were to offer up sacrifice. And again, that was Aaron and his sons, okay? And that sacrifice, all right, or them being intercessors or mediators was how they were a gift unto the children of Israel, all right? Now, when you go into this word gift here in Numbers, the 18th chapter, in the sixth verse. And Lord's will in this lesson all comes together, but I just want to go into the origins of this and how that transferred over unto Yahweh Shai and this modern day priesthood mm -hmm. and how we act as that gift. Shalom to y'all in the comment board. Shalom. Okay. So this is the word gift here in this particular verse. And that word there is Mathanah. And that's where you get the name Matthew from, okay? That's where you get the name Matthias. Like um, you had two of the 12 disciples, Matthew and Matthias, okay? Their name ultimately goes into them being a gift, all right? And they were a gift. They were two of the 12 disciples. And then you also have Matthias, all right? The, the father of, um, of the Maccabees, all right? Of Judas, Simon, Jonathan, all of them. Again, he was a gift, all right? Well, that's what the name means. It means a gift, Okay? So when you go into this word methana, or gift here, it says a gift, and it also says a present, specifically in a good sense, a sacrificial offering. Okay, so the reason why the Levites here were a gift unto the children of Israel because they had the duties of the inheritance of the Lord that was given unto them. They were the intercessors, all right? In order for the sins of the children of Israel to be cleansed, you needed a priest under the Levitical priesthood to offer up that sacrifice so that wrath of the Lord that we explained earlier wouldn't be brought forth unto the children of Israel, okay? So you see it had played out back then in history, 
Okay, you needed a mediator. A mediator was needed in order for us to be in good state and good graces with the Most High. Okay, just as you look at Yahweh Shai. All right, remember we were all under a curse. Earlier it went into the wrath of the Most High. Okay, we are all under the curse. If you read Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, that is a curse that we fell under because we had transgressed against the Heavenly Father. Okay, and part of that was due to the lack of offerings that we was given. And a large portion of it was also due to the priesthood and how that had gotten corrupted throughout time. And you can read about the prophet Malachi, because when you read the book of Malachi, Malachi's message is directed to the priesthood. Okay, but... When you go into all those different things, that's why the Lord has stripped his, his name away from us for that period of time. Okay, and there was wrath and there was a curse that was set among us. And the Lord had to send his son Yahabashai to make a change. All right, and ultimately it had to be done through prophecy. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next precept here. And this is going to be, be in the book of Numbers, the eighth chapter. Because earlier I read in Numbers 18, okay, it went into how the Levites were a gift. Okay, so when you read this here, hold on. When you read this here in the book of Numbers, the eighth chapter, and you jump down to the 19th verse, let me see here. I'm going to start at Numbers 8 and 18, all right? And it reads, and I have taken the Levites for all the firstborn of the children of Israel, okay? Now, right here, he considers the Levites being the firstborn. Which, if you have understanding about that, technically the firstborn child of the Israelites, all right, or, or Jacob, I should say, was Reuben, okay? It was Reuben, I see a son, all right, Ra'aban, that's what that means. But he's considering the Levites to be his firstborn, okay? Because they were the ones, again, that had offered up that sacrifice unto the, unto the Most High for the iniquities and to make an atonement for the children of Israel, Okay? Verse 19 says, and I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron, to his sons from among the children of Israel. Okay, so there's that um, there's that gift again. Okay, it says to do the services of the children of Israel in the tabernacle of the congregation and to make an atonement for the children of Israel. That there be no plague among the children of Israel when the children of Israel come nigh unto the sanctuary. So I had explained that earlier going into how it was important for those sacrifices, for those, for those priests to offer up sacrifice for the children of Israel. So that would preserve or I should say set back the plague that the Most High would have sent. OK, now earlier in Numbers, the 18th chapter, I went into the word gift there and that word there was matana. OK, now when you go into this word gift right here in Numbers, the 8th chapter, that word gift here is Nathan, and that's where you get the word Nathaniel from, okay, or Nathan. That means a gift, but it also means to give, okay? So when you go into this word here, because it acts as a synonym to what we just read earlier in Numbers 18, all right? So when you go into this word here, gift, it says to give, to put, to set, okay? And there's a, there's a word that stands out on here. Let's see. Let me, there we go. It says to be given up to be bestowed, to be given up, to be delivered up, okay? So the priesthood was needed, all right, so we wouldn't be delivered up to the wrath or the plague that the Lord was going to bring, all right? And again, that goes into how that was a gift, okay? That was a gift that was given by the Most High, okay? The priesthood was a gift that was given unto the nation of Israel from the Most High, okay? And as that priesthood offered a sacrifice to make an atonement for the nation of Israel, you have the ultimate high priest, which is Yahawashai, that had offered him himself, okay, to be a gift unto the elect, okay? And as Yahawashai had sacrificed himself, okay, to make an atonement for the nation of Israel, we ourselves make our bodies a living sacrifice for the elect, okay? As Paul says in Timothy, and I'm going to get that, let me see here, I believe... Paul says, I endure all things for the elect's sake. Let me see here if I can find it. This is 2 Timothy chapter 2 and 10. It says, therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation, which is in Yahweh Shah Mashiach with eternal glory. 
okay? And again, that was the burden that the priests had to bear, okay? The burden of the, they had to endure all things for the nation of Israel. And you look at it today because we're not under the order of Aaron no more, but we're under another priesthood, okay? And as the Levites were that gift, the priests were that gift unto the nation of Israel, we ourselves are a gift unto the elect, okay? And our portion is offering of sacrifice. Our portion is enduring everything that we got to go through because, again, that's part of sacrifice. And we do it for the elect's sake, okay? Now, what I'm going to do is, because I mentioned earlier, I read 1 Peter chapter 2 going into how we are a spiritual priesthood and we offer up spiritual sacrifice, okay? And that ultimately started with Yahweh's child, okay? Now, I'm going to read this here in the book of Hebrews, the seventh chapter. And I believe it's in verse 15. Let me see here. This is the book of Hebrew, chapter 7. And I'm going to start at verse 11. Because now I'm going to go into the transferring of the priesthood from the order of Aaron unto Yahweh. Okay? And it says in Hebrews 7 11, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Okay? And when you read here, Hebrews, the seventh chapter is a bad chapter, all right, because he's going in to how that priesthood had already existed even before the order of Aaron, okay? And that priesthood that existed before the order of Aaron was through Melchizedek, all right? Because you remember when you read about Melchizedek in Genesis, the 14th chapter, he was the one that our forefather Abraham gave tenth or a tithe of his spoil unto, okay? Matter of fact. Just so I can pull that example up here. That was in Genesis, the 14th chapter, I believe. Let me see. Bear with me one sec. I'm going to find a verse. Because Paul is alluding to Genesis 14. All right. When he's writing this to the Hebrews, Paul is alluding to what our forefather Abraham had offered up unto Melchizedek. And you can read that earlier in Hebrews 7 chapter. And I just for time's sake, I'm not going to go into that. All right. But whenever you have spare time, you can do that for yourself. But this is the book of Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. It says in Melchizedek, king of Salem, which Salem was actually a name for Jerusalem before it was called Jerusalem. All right. And that word Salem or Shalom means peace. All right. And Melchizedek means king of righteousness. All right. So, hey, man, if you can receive it, Melchizedek is your Abishai. Melchizedek was the king of righteousness. Melchizedek was the king of peace. OK, as your Abishai. OK, it says in Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the most high God. And he blessed him and that him being Abraham. All right. And it says he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the most high God which had delivered thine enemies into thine hand, and he gave him tithes of all. All right, and that word tithe goes into the word tenth. Matter of fact, let's find that. That word there, tithe in the Hebrew is ma'ashar, okay, ma'ashar. And when you go into this word, this word means a tenth part, okay? So Abraham, in order to be blessed by this priest, all right, be blessed by the Most High, he had to give a tenth unto this intercessor, okay, because the priest was the intercessor, okay? Am I still recording? Hold on, let me see if I'm still recording. <laughs> Boy. Hold on. Am I still recording? If I'm still recording, somebody can say it. I'm going to look it up on here. Let's see. Okay, okay. I'm still recording. Salaki. Yay, man. It's been it's the third time I'm trying to do this lesson, man. <laughs> it's jacked up every time. Okay, the water, brother. It's the water. So I'm going to get back to what I was explaining earlier. But when you go into that, Abram had given a tenth part of his substance that he received in the slaying of the kings. All right. He had given that unto the priests. Okay, and Abraham was blessed after that. 
Okay, so when you read this back here in Hebrews the seventh chapter, where I, where I left off at Hebrews seven and seven and um, eleven, it says that therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood. It reads for under under it the people received the law. All right, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Okay. Because Abraham offering up spiritual sacrifice, well, really he offered up sacrifice. With him offering up sacrifice to Melchizedek, he had offered that sacrifice, and that was pertaining to the order of Melchizedek. All right, now Abraham was blessed, and the blessing that he received was that his seed was going to be blessed, and the Messiah was ultimately going to come out of his loins, okay? But a priesthood that came out of um, Abraham's loins, and that was Levi, all right? And as Levi was given a priesthood and that was given by the order of Aaron, all right, as that was given, there had to be offerings and sacrificings that had to be given unto Levitical priesthood, okay? Remember, as I'm going into this lesson, the priesthood was a gift, all right, that was given unto the children of Israel, all right? And Melchizedek was a gift that was given because as Abraham received, I'm sorry, as Abraham had given that tenth, what happened? Abraham was blessed afterwards, man. He was blessed after he had given that. And that was a gift that was given unto Abraham for offering sacrifice unto that priest. All right. And you remember when Abraham had done all these things, Abraham to a degree was like a remnant back then. All right. And we was going into this in a, in a class we had a few weeks back. When you go into Abraham, all right, Abraham offered up his tithing due to faith. All right. When Abraham first received the truth, remember Abraham's father was a heathen pretty much. All right. Terah was technically a heathen because he was following heathen ways. And the Lord had woken up Abraham and had made him go into the land of Canaan. All right. And as Abraham sojourned and went on his journey, he had a bunch of different tribulations and things that he had to go through and a lot of experiences. All right. And one of those experiences was the spoil that he had received from those sodomites. And he had given that spoil or the tent of that spoil unto the priesthood. All right. And that opened up a window of heaven of blessings that Abraham couldn't even receive it. And he did. When I say he couldn't receive it, I mean, I should word it that he didn't even have enough room to receive it because he had received an eternal blessing after that. Okay. But I'm going to continue to read this in Hebrews 7 and 12. It says, for the priesthood being changed, there is made a necessity a change also of the law. All right. So that priesthood was transferred. Okay. Ultimately, it was set up by Melchizedek. OK, and it was changed to the order of Aaron. All right. And that order of Aaron, as I explained earlier, was more so a spiritual or a carnal example of a spiritual priesthood that already existed in the heavens. OK, so it says. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaining another tribe of which no man gave attendance to the altar, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood, okay? Because you remember, it was spoken of out of all the tribes that the priesthood would be given unto the Levites, okay? But it also says, and it is yet far more evident. So he's saying that it is evident that our Lord spread from Judah, but now he's saying something that is far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. And he's explaining that this is far more evident than what was explained back then. Okay? So he's pretty much explaining that the transferring of the priesthood had to take place. Okay? And the reason why he's saying this is because it expressed this and it explained this in prophecy. Okay? When you read it in the book of Genesis 49, it says Judah is his lawgiver. Matter of fact, let me go on and pull this precept out. It's a few of them actually. This is Genesis 49 and 10. It says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And who is Shiloh? That's Yahweh Shai. And unto him shall a gathering of the people be. Okay, so, so Yahweh Shai had to come. All right. It says here in Genesis 49, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver. All right. So a lawgiver had to come from Judah because the priests were the ultimate lawgivers. They were the ones that had enforced the law. They were the ones that had to read about the law and they had to act strictly on the law, all right? And they were the lights or the example 
to live so the children of Israel would follow. Okay, and again, that's why they were a gift because they were the literal example of how to conduct themselves in righteousness. Okay, and again, they offered up um, sacrifice. But right here in Genesis 49, it goes into how there's not going to be a lawgiver that's not going to, there's going to be a lawgiver that's not going to depart from Judah. Okay, so here, I'm going to also read this in the book of um, Psalms. This is Psalm 60 and 7. It says, Gilead is mine and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the strength of mine head. Judah is my lawgiver. Okay, so this is another example going into Judah has to be that ultimate lawgiver. All right, and ultimately the way that Judah was that lawgiver was through Yahalashai coming on the scene. All right, and being that priest that the Most High spake nothing of Judah concerning priesthood. Okay, but through prophecy, for prophecy's sake, it had to be transferred from the Levites and be transferred unto Judah. Okay, and I'm going to bring that account here in the Apocrypha. And it's going to be in the book of Sirach, chapter 45. And this is the transferring of that. As Paul had alluded to Hebrews 7, going into the order of Melchizedek and going into how it is evident that our Lord sprang from Judah. Okay, this right here, our forefather is explaining how the priesthood was transferred from Aaron unto David, okay? And shalom to y'all jumping on. Whatever precepts y'all post, Lord's will, after the lesson, I read some of them. But this is the book of um, Sirach, chapter 45, and I'm going to start at verse 20. And it says, but he made Aaron more honorable. And remember, Aaron was the father of the priesthood back then, okay? Aaron was the first high priest. All right, under the order of Aaron, okay? So it says, but he made Aaron more honorable and gave him inheritance and divided unto him the first fruits of the increase, especially he prepared bread in abundance, okay? So when you go into this, all right, the first fruits of increase was given unto Aaron and his sons, as I explained earlier. And again, that goes into that tithe. As Abraham had given a tenth, of his tithe of the Melchizedek, that was the first fruits of his substance, okay? That was an enactment that had to be taken place by the children of Israel, giving that tenth of their first fruits unto the priesthood, all right? And if that wasn't done, the Lord would send forth his wrath and his plague unto the nation of Israel, okay? But if that was done, then the Most High promised that he would rain down blessings upon us. And you can read that in the book of Malachi, the third chapter, okay? So when you read this here, it says in verse 21, for they eat of the sacrifices of the Lord, which he gave unto him and his seed. All right. So not only Aaron, the high priest, ate of those sacrifices, but his sons after him that had operated in the priesthood ate of those sacrifices as well. OK, how be it in the land of the people he had no inheritance. And earlier I read that precept in Deuteronomy chapter 10. OK, it says neither had he any portion among the people. For the Lord himself is his portion and his inheritance. And he's just quoting what was read earlier in Deuteronomy 10. Verse 23 says, the third in glory is Phinehas, the son of Eleazar. And Phinehas was the grandson of Aaron, the high priest. Because he had zeal in the fear of the Lord and stood up with good courage of heart when the people were turned back and made reconciliation to Israel. Because you remember, Phinehas had taken away that abomination, but all pure away from the children of Israel. And I believe you can read about that account. And uh, I believe that's in Numbers, the 25th chapter. As Israel went a whoring after Baal Peor, Phinehas had thrusted a few of those jades through along with the heathen. All right, I believe it was with a javelin. And he had killed them. And that had brought forth fear unto the children of Israel. And that had caused the Israelites to turn away from Baal Peor. So that was a valiant act that our forefather Phinehas done. So valiant that that's something that the Most High recorded. And he had given Phinehas a blessing. And he had given Phinehas the portion of being the high priest after his father Aaron. Okay. It says in verse 24. Therefore was there a covenant of peace made with him. That he should be the chief of the sanctuary of his people. The high priest. And that he and his posterity. Many children. Should have the dignity of the priesthood forever. Okay. So we're still in the time right now. But it says forever. So are the Levites still the ones that offer up the sacrifices? Are the Levites still the ones 
that um that have the main duties of the sanctuary? No. Now, for those of them that might read this and don't have understanding, they'll look at this and say that this is a contradiction. When it's not a contradiction, just people don't have proper understanding of the scriptures. All right, but it's going to further allude on what it means. Because here it says that Aaron and his son was going to have a priesthood forever. Okay, earlier I explained that the priesthood was changed and it was transferred from the Levites unto David and his line. Okay, so when you read this here, in Sirach um, 45 and 25, it says, according to the covenant made with David, the son of Jesse, and the tribe of Judah. Now it's going into David, the son of Jesse, and the tribe of Judah, and it's going to a covenant that was made with him. Okay? And it says that the inheritance of the king should be to his posterity alone. Okay? So now he's saying the inheritance of the king was given unto David's posterity or his seed or his children alone. Okay, but check this out. It says, so the inheritance of Aaron should be unto his seed. And what was the inheritance that was given unto Aaron? The priesthood. So now it's saying that the priesthood was given unto the seed of David. All right, and how was that fulfilled ultimately? It was fulfilled with Yahushua. Because if you can look at it through the spirit, even David himself was a priest. Okay, that's why David was able to eat of that showbread and he wasn't judged for it. <laughs> because David was a priest, all right, and David was a priest of righteousness, okay, and David had his son Solomon, all right, now when you read about it, Solomon was anointed with the oil from Zadok the high priest, and that oil that was given unto um, Solomon to be anointed was only supposed to be for the sanctuary, okay, but it was a reason why Solomon was anointed with that oil that was given unto the priesthood, because that was the start of something that was to change. That was the start of a priesthood changing, okay? And that's why Paul had alluded to Hebrews 11, the seventh chapter, going into the changing of that priesthood. And you read about that changing of that priesthood here in the book of Sirach, the 45th chapter, all right? The way that that was going to stand forever, as it was read earlier, going into, going into Sirach 45 and 24, all right, I went into how his posterity and his dignity of the priesthood was going to endure and last forever. All right, but I was talking about Levi. But the way that that had lasted and endured forever was that it had changed from Levi and it continued on, all right, through David and his seed. All right, ultimately being fulfilled with Yahushai, who, if you can receive it, is Melchizedek. Okay, because earlier in Hebrews 7, it said that. Okay, in Hebrews 7 chapter. Let's see here. It said that Yahweh was a priest out of the likenesshood of Melchizedek, or out of the similitude of Melchizedek. And when you go into that word similitude there, that word similitude means likeness. Okay? So, I'm going to finish this off by reading two more precepts that I had. Lord, when this lesson is coming together, making sense. But I'm going to read this here in the book of Malachi, the second chapter. And earlier I said when you read Malachi, Malachi was a prophet who was cursing them priests out, man, because they started being wicked. Oh, they 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 were oh, they were being wicked, you know. They were offering up wax sacrifices, they were offering up blemished lambs and such. And Malachi was a spiritual wake-up call unto the priesthood, man. But this is the book of Malachi, chapter 2, verse 4. And it says, And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. All right, and earlier I read about Levi and how Levi, all right, was a gift unto the nation of Israel, okay? Because again, they were the ones that offered up and sacrificed for the atonement of the children of Israel, okay? So it says, the law of truth was in his mouth and iniquity was not found in his lips, but it's talking about Levi, okay? Now, when you read about this particular Levi here, and I'm sorry, I forgot to read verse 5, but this Levi here isn't talking about actual Levi, okay? This Levi here is acting as a spiritual representation of Yahweh Shai, man. All right, and the reason how we know this, when you continue to read this in Malachi 2 and 5, it says, My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. All right, and that account you can read about when Yahweh was in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
All right, and he had feared the Most High and pleaded with the Most High right there before he was offered up as a sacrifice. Verse 6 says this, the law of truth was in his mouth and iniquity was not found in his lips. That ain't talking about the, the old priesthood because you remember the Lord had to do away with the old priesthood because that we couldn't keep it perfectly. Okay, there was definitely iniquity that was found within the ancient priesthood. Okay, now it was set up to be righteousness, but we couldn't keep it. Okay, the Levites couldn't keep it. Okay, but with Yahweh Shai, there was not iniquity that was found in his lips. Yahweh Shai was a man that was found with no guile. That way he could be that unblemished lamb or that worthy sacrifice to be offered up for our transgressions. Okay, it says, he walked with me in peace and equity. It did turn many away from iniquity. And what does it mean to turn away? It means repentance. Okay? And what does that sound like? You read this here in the book of um, Acts, the fifth chapter. One sec. My internet's acting up right now. Let's just read it here. So this is the book of Acts, chapter 5, verse 29. It says, Then Peter... And the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey the Most High rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Yahweh Shah, whom he slew and hanged on a tree. Him had the Most High exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, forgive repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Okay? So that's how he had turned many away from iniquity. Okay? Because Yahweh Shah being offered up on that stake, all right, that was done so we could turn back from our iniquity. And repentance was given unto us, okay? And that's why Yahweh Shai ultimately is the fulfillment of that gift being given. Because without Yahweh Shai, we would be done. We would still be under the curse of the law, as the scriptures say. But Yahweh Shai was given to be a gift unto the elect. And as Yahweh Shai was that gift being unto the elect, all right, we follow suit with Yahweh Shai by offering ourselves as being sacrificed as well for, for, the, for the elect, that's why I read that precept going into it in 2 Timothy, I endure all things for the elect's sake, okay? So I'm going to end this off here in the book of Malachi, the third chapter, because it went into Malachi 2 as a covenant of peace was given unto Levi, and this Levi acted as an antitype or a symbolic representation to Yahweh Shai. But here it goes into the sons of Levi in Malachi, the third chapter, all right? As it went into Levi, Malachi 2, it's going into Levi's sons, in Malachi 3, as you go into Aaron, the high priest, before, and you go into the sons of Aaron later, and that was the whole embodiment of the priesthood, right? Now you have this in Malachi, the third chapter, and I'm going to start at the top. It says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. All right, now this messenger is talking about as a prophecy as pertaining to John the Baptist. And you find it very spiritual that John the Baptist was an actual Levite, okay? He was the son of a priest. You remember his father, Zechariah, was a priest that had the duty of offering of incense in the temple, okay? And it talks about that he shall, um, it says, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek, Yahweh Shai, shall suddenly come to his temple. And that was fulfilled as Yahweh Shai had went, and he was baptized by John the Baptist, okay? He had went to his church, Okay, because John the Baptist's followers were there and they were a witness to Yahweh Shai being dumped in that water. And Andrew was actually one of them that was there that bore witness to that. I believe John the Revelator was also another one that was there. Okay, it says, Even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? Now, this is going into a future prophecy. Okay, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a full of soap. And this is talking about Yahweh Shai. All right. And that's why John the Baptist had explained earlier going into, or when I say earlier, in Matthew, the third chapter, all right, he says, I baptize with water. But he who cometh after me, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, shall baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. Okay. So this is what that's talking about. That refiner, that refiner's fire is talking about Yahweh Shai. Okay. But it says here in verse 3, and he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. Now, why does it say the sons of Levi right here in Malachi 3 and 3? 
Because this is talking about an end time prophecy. And around the end times, the Levitical priesthood didn't have the charge of offering up sacrifice no more. But that was given back unto the order of Melchizedek, starting with Yahweh Shai. But you read about these sons of Levi right here, and this is a spiritual representation of the elect. Okay? Because Levi, again, the priesthood was given. All right? But earlier, we read earlier in Sirach 45, that priesthood was changed unto the posterity of David. And that was changed with Yahweh Shai. Okay? And it says, And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer up unto the Lord an offering of righteousness. And how are we offering up unto, the, unto, um, unto a righteous sacrifice? We do that by offering up ourselves, okay? That's why I read earlier in Romans 12, we make ourselves as a living sacrifice, okay? As Yahweh Shai offered up himself as a sacrifice so all of us could be able to receive the word and that curse wouldn't be beset upon us no more. But within that, we have to ourselves offer up sacrifice because this is part of our heritage, okay? This is part of our inheritance, being the priesthood, okay? It says, then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord. So why does it go into the sons of Levi? But later on, it's talking about the offering of Judah, okay? Because earlier in Genesis 49, it says, the lawgiver shall not depart from Judah, okay? Meaning that it had to be fulfilled through Judah, okay? And as that was fulfilled through Judah with Yahweh there was a floodgate that was opened up where every single last one of us act as priests, all right? And it's not under the order of Aaron, but it's under the similitude of the order of Melchizedek. I was explained earlier in Hebrews, the seventh chapter, okay? When Yahweh Shai was slain, all right? As a matter of fact, I can read that here in Matthew um, 27. But you remember when Yahweh Shai was slain, all right? As he had given up the ghost, the earth was rent and the temple was rent. All right. And that temple veil was split in two. And that was a symbolic representation of that changing in that priesthood. OK, so this is the book of Matthew, chapter 27. Oh, boy. Yeah, I'm having issues with my Internet right now. It's all good, though. Hey, it bees like that. I Means we're doing, we doing something right out here. When I say we, I'm talking about me and you brothers on the comment board that's also diligent with these precepts I see y'all bringing out and Lord as well I get a chance to read them here in a minute but this is in the book of Matthew the 27th chapter let me see here I'm going to go on to the point where Yahweh had given up the ghost This is Matthew chapter 27, verse 50. Yahweh Shai, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. All right, so this is when Yahweh Shai had given up the ghost. Okay? It says, oh, shoot, I just left my spot. Verse 51, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Okay? And it says, and came out of the graves, I'm sorry, Verse 52, and the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. All right, so when you go into the dead that was risen after that had taken place, that actually happened. But that was actually a spiritual representation of us waking up, going back into an ancient way, going back into an ancient order of a priesthood that existed far before because when Yahweh Shai had given up the ghost, it said the earth was rent and the temple was rent. Now, earlier in this lesson, I went into the, the, the veils, all right, within the first veil, all right, because that veil is that tent, all right, or that, um, or that division. That first veil was within that. You had the table, the showbread that the priest had eat off of. You also had the, 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 the candlestick, the seven candlesticks, okay? And you had the wine, all right? Now, within the second veil, you had the Ark of the Testimony, the Holies of Holies. Now, around that time, the Ark of the Testimony wasn't there because that was taken out by Jeremiah before Nebuchadnezzar had seized Jerusalem, okay? But you still had that, that um, Holies of Holies that was there. So originally, the Ark of the Testimony had rested in the Holies of Holies, and you also had the golden censer, which the high priest would um, offer up that incense unto the Most High, 
Okay. So as Yahushua had given up the ghost, that was torn in two. Mm -hmm. All right. And that was a representation of that changing or that alteration within that priesthood. All right. How it wasn't by the children of Levi that had offered up the sacrifice, but it got changed to all the tribes of Israel, starting with Judah, the lawgiver. All right. Spiritually representing Yahushua as that high priest. Okay. And those dead bodies had arose out of those graves. And that was the start of something new that had changed. Okay. That's why after Yahushua was slain and they resurrected, the Holy Spirit was given unto us. All right. And that's why I wanted to read that in the book of First Peter chapter 2, going into that spiritual priesthood. Okay. So I'm going to end it off on that. Lord, when this was edifying, I'm going to read some of y'all comments, your precepts that y'all posted, and it can be ended off on that. Okay. Remnant saved. Yeah, yeah. John the Baptist was of the line of Aaron. That's right. That's right. Shalom. Shalom. Let's see here. Isaiah 12 and 3. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And we were able to do that with Yahweh Shai's sacrifice, man. All right. Let's see here. Sirach 44 and 22. With Isaac, did he establish likewise for Abraham, his father's sake, for blessing of all men in the covenant and made it rest upon the head of Jacob. He acknowledged. That's right. That's right. Hey, this thing is only for Israel, man. All right. When you read about these scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament, this is only that. This is something that was only given unto the children of Israel because I brought up that point earlier going into the temple veil ramp and the Christian church goes into how that was how everybody came in. No, that was just a change in the priesthood. That was a change of the priesthood from the order of Aaron unto the order of Melchizedek. Okay. That was the fulfillment of that, I should say. Let me see here. Died garments of Basra. Let's see. Hebrews 3 and 1 through 4. It says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, again, that's the holy priesthood, considered the apostle and high priest of our um of our profession, Yahweh Mashiach, and that shows you too that Yahweh was um an apostle who was faithful to him that appointed him also. Moses was faithful in all his house, for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house, for every man's house is built by some man, but he that built all things of the most high. All right, and the reason. Why well, Yahweh was given more honor than Moses, because you remember the law was given unto Moses, and that was a very high honor to have, because technically Moses was a king. You know, technically, if you want to get down to the nitty gritty, Moses was a king, and you can read about that. It says Moses was king in Jeshurun. Okay, matter of fact, hey, let's go on and read that real quick. Hold on one sec. One second, Bob Kishaw. I gotta find it. All right. Goodness gracious. This computer acting slow as head. All right. Yeah, this is it. Deuteronomy 33 and 5. Salaki. Goodness gracious, internet tripping. All right, so this is the book of Deuteronomy. Just because just I made that point, I would like to go into the precepts. But this is Deuteronomy 33 and 5. It says in 4, Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob, which is the precept that the brother had posted, or which is a precept to the precept that the brother posted. Verse, verse 5, and he was king in Jeshurun, when the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. Okay, so Moses technically was a king. All right, and Jeshurun is another name for Israel. Okay, so when you go into that, Yahweh was given more honor than even Moses. All right, he was given so much honor that he is the catalyst of a new priesthood and a new kingdomship. Okay, because you have Yahweh that was fulfillment of being a king and a priest. And who else was a king and a priest? Melchizedek. Okay, which is the same exact thing, man. So, man, what we're entering into, what we're a part of is something that had existed all right, already in the heavens. And we're just reestablishing it through the spirit. Okay. 
But amen, as the priest operated as that gift unto the nation of Israel, man, hey, we're doing the same thing, starting with Yahweh Shai. Okay? So I'm going to end it off on that. Lord, when it was edifying, I believe I touched upon a point. Hopefully it wasn't drawn out too much. But I want to give all praise, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai, Bahashem, Kakadash. Double alliance to our apostle and elders of Great Millstone. Peace and blessing and many salutations to you, elect Akim, across the four winds of this earth, pushing this word of sincerity and the truth. Shalom.